Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Every song comes from some kind of story. Sometimes it's just the story of a feeling, good or bad, or maybe it's just a way of getting a point of view across. Other songs are actual stories. They have a narrative and characters and drama and a beginning, middle, and end. It's like a short story that's sung instead of written down in a book. But what if you're a composer and you have a story that's too long and too complex to fit inside a standard four-minute song? Well, then you have to start thinking about breaking up the story into its constituent parts and maybe spreading things out over multiple songs. Do this over enough songs and you've created a concept album, a record where the story or a series of themes link everything together back to front and front to back. Your four-minute musical short story has grown into an hour-long musical novel. Concept albums were big business in the late 1960s and 1970s. Prog rock bands were all over them, and the more complex, the better. I mean, just look at Rush's 1976 album, 2112. We've got the Red Star of the Solar Federation, and the priests who run the temples of Syrinx in their command over existence, and then we have the rebel guitar player who rises up and then commits suicide. This whole thing was inspired by Ayn Rand, the objectivist philosopher who wrote books like Atlas Shrugged, heavy stuff. A little too heavy, actually. When punk rock came along with its two-minute, two-chord songs of burning hate, the concept album fell out of favor for a very long time. But then a funny thing happened. The concept album was slowly and carefully resurrected. And by the time we got to the first years of the 21st century, bam! We got tons of them. And most of them came from alt-rock bands, those spiritual descendants from the punk's that killed the concept albums back in the 1970s. This is part two of the history of the concept album in alt-rock. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Hi again, I'm Alan Cross, and this will be another program filled with stories and motifs and ideas, notions, narratives, librettos, philosophies, theses, dissertations, and statements. We're talking about concept albums. Although such records were mostly the domain of prog rock and mainstream rock bands through the years, I think we established in part one that there's been an alt-rock component to the concept album through the decades. We went back to the 1970s for records from Bowie and Kraftwerk before we moved on to a breakthrough hardcore album from Husker Du in the 1980s. And then in the 90s, we had Nine Inch Nails and the Smashing Pumpkins and Weezer. But as you'll see in a second, all that was nothing compared to what we've seen in terms of alt-rock concept albums in the 21st century. Now, the first one of the new century seemed to be songs from an American movie, Volume 1, Learning How to Smile, from Everclear. The construction is a bit loose, but it's based on what leader Art Alexicus went through with his second divorce. It came out in July of 2000. This album was mostly about the happy part of marriage, the falling in love, the courting, the good times, and the nostalgia. But then it was followed by Songs from an American Movie Volume 2, A Good Time for a Bad Attitude. That came out in November of 2000. This record focuses on the anger that comes with a breakup. Let's stick with that first record because it was the better received of the two. This is Everclear and AM Radio. You'd have to wait but you could hear it on the AM Radio. Yeah, you could hear the music on the AM Radio. Everclear, an AM radio from the first part of a two-volume divorce experience called Songs from an American Movie. The next alt-rock album of the new century was probably Machina, the Machines of God from the Smashing Pumpkins. Billy Corgan was pretty bitter and disillusioned by how the band was being portrayed in the media, and the group itself would break up by the end of the year as a result. But before that happened, these feelings were translated into a double album that involved a rock star character named Zero, a guy Billy based on himself. Upon hearing the voice of God, Zero renames himself Glass. He renames his band The Machines of God, and they attract a fan base called The Ghost Children. Now, if you care to read through the liner notes and check some of the web postings from the band from that period, you'll see that there are all kinds of references to glass and shards of glass. There was also an online component, the Machina Mystery, which was pretty clever marketing for its day. Odd video clips, strange websites, an alternate reality game. And at one point, Sony was even going to create a series of animated shorts for the web, but 
that never happened dot-com bubble you understand it was all very ambitious too ambitious given the state of the pumpkins and their record company relationship but it was groundbreaking as we shall see this was a single from machina the machines of god it's called stand inside your love The Smashing Pumpkins with Stand Inside Your Love from their 2000 concept record Machina, The Machines of God. The next record I want to touch on is Songs for the Deaf from Queens of the Stone Age in the summer of 2002. A lot of people don't realize that this was conceived as a concept record, but but it is. But if you're not sure what to listen for, it's, it's really quite easy to miss. This is supposed to be taken as a soundtrack of a drive from Los Angeles through to Joshua Tree National Park out in the desert while flipping through small town radio stations along the way. Hence the dashboard of a Fiat 124 Spider shown in the artwork of some versions of the album. Just something to look for if you have that album in your collection. Now, when putting together a project like this, you don't necessarily have to go for big, complicated themes. Just ask Mike Skinner the rapper behind The Streets. In May of 2004, he released his second album, A Grand Don't Come For Free, and it basically tells of the everyday activities of a regular British guy, and things aren't really going all that well for him. We can look at each song as a chapter in this quest of our hero as he tries to locate a thousand pounds that has mysteriously disappeared. Along the way, he breaks up with his girlfriend, who is actually sleeping with his friend. He drinks too much, takes too many drugs, fights with the TV repairman, and ends up finding the $1,000 that was hidden in his TV set the entire time. Here's the chapter where, after a night of drinking, he tries to pick up a girl. And it doesn't go well. I'm not trying to pull you, even though I would like to. I think you are really fit, you're fit, but my gosh, don't you know me? Wait, just as you started to make your big advance, with the milkshake and that little donut in hand... The Streets with Fit But You Know It, from Mike Skinner's 2004 concept album, A Grand Don't Come For Free. That was from the spring. Big record, but the main event came in the fall. That was Green Day and American Idiot. I mean, Wow. Not only was this a concept album, but it was designed as a full-blown rock opera. Now, I gotta be honest about this. When I first heard about this project, my reaction was, seriously? You're going to try and revive your career by doing something The Who was doing in 1969? See, Green Day had fallen out of favor with a lot of fans. Things had gotten old and tired, and there was talk that the band was done. This rock opera was their last-ditch shot at salvaging something and I, I remember thinking yeah good luck with that okay i was wrong an american idiot was actually an accident legend has it that after the band mysteriously lost the master tapes to a record that was supposed to be called cigarettes and valentines they decided to start from scratch instead of remaking that record each band member had an assignment come up with something anything even if it's just 30 seconds long we got to get ideas flowing this is the way we'll do it so that's what they did And then something weird happened. These fragments sounded good. And they sounded even better when they were strung together in certain ways. And after a while, the thinking became, hey, you know what? We've got all these little movements within these longer pieces. Why don't we go back and listen to those old Who rock operas and Andrew Lloyd Webber's Jesus Christ Superstar to see if there's anything there that can help us make sense of all this? So that's what they did. And out of everything came American Idiot. It's the story of Jesus of Suburbia, a powerless anti-hero who hates his existence and the world around him. He leaves town for the city and eventually encounters St. Jimmy, who's a punk rock kid, and he also meets What's-Her-Name, a riot girl type person. The libretto gets a little confusing about halfway through, but we think that there are themes of love, staying true to your values, and, uh, well, some other stuff. St. Jimmy apparently commits suicide. Jesus of Suburbia loses track of what's-her-name, and we think, and this is completely open to interpretation, as far as the original album goes anyway, that we're supposed to realize that Jesus of Suburbia and St. Jimmy are actually the same person. When American Idiot was adapted for a stage musical, things were rearranged and expanded to help everything make more sense. Now, Jesus of Suburbia is the name given to Johnny. St. Jimmy's suicide is metaphorical, and there are new characters like Tunny, and as well as a denouement that involves acceptance and hope 
And everything ends with a cast rendition of Good Riddance, Time of Your Life. You got all that? Let's go back to the original recording. Boulevard of Broken Dreams was the second single from the record, and it's sung from the point of Jesus of Suburbia, who finds the city a little too much for him. Have a listen. I walk this empty street on the boulevard of broken dreams Where the city sleeps and I'm the only one and I walk alone Green Day and Boulevard of Broken Dreams from American Idiots, which is not only the most successful alt-rock concept album ever, but one of the most successful concept records ever, period. Once Green Day showed that it could be done, and once rock fans showed that they were open to this whole idea of an album as a concept, more people jumped in. A lot more. This is part two of the history of the concept album in alt-rock. I'm Alan Cross. After Green Day sold about 10 million copies of all the CDs and all the DVDs associated with American Idiot, other songwriters decided to try their hand at the idea of the concept record. And I suspect they were encouraged by their record company masters and managers. Why? iTunes and downloading. See, fans were getting far too used to the idea of being able to just buy one song at a time and not buying full albums. A concept record didn't make sense unless you bought the whole thing, right? Maybe this was a way of keeping the idea of the album alive. Think about it. The next major project came from My Chemical Romance, who released The Black Parade on October 23, 2006. And like American Idiot, this was a rock opera. And like Green Day, My Chemical Romance was on the reprise label. So... Maybe the label was thinking, hey, if we did it once, maybe we can do it again. The central character was the patient. As he's about to die and move to the other side, his memories and impressions are captured in the songs. And when the patient eventually dies, he's transported away by a parade, the black parade of the title. Apparently, it has something to do with a fond childhood memory and how leader Gerard Way thinks death will come for us. In concert, My Chemical Romance was very theatrical about all this. Lots of role-playing and costumes. And it's all captured in the first video for Welcome to the Block Parade, which was the first single. Give a listen to that and see if some of the pieces fall into place. My Chemical Romance and Welcome to the Black Parade, the title track of their concept album. Now, my favorite alt-rock concept album of all time is Year Zero from Nine Inch Nails. This project was so complicated and so multidimensional that I've actually done an entire show on it. Trent Reznor conceived everything as a soundtrack to a movie or a TV series that might get made. It's a fictionalized alternate future history of what might happen to the United States in the years after 2007 as the government becomes more repressive. The level of thought and the intricacies of the execution of the promotion of this album was absolutely mind-boggling. It would take me half an hour just to explain the online components of all this. And it all hung together brilliantly with fans actively involved in a massive worldwide scavenger hunt for clues. Year Zero is so compelling that HBO and the BBC are working together to create a sci-fi miniseries based on the record. Some major, major money and some big, big players are involved. I hope this works out. A track called Capital G was a single for the record, and the G stands for Greed, and it also stands for George W. Bush. There's a lot of me Nine Inch Nails and Capital G from the brilliant Year Zero concept album. By the time that whole thing played out, Green Day was ready with another record, and it was another rock opera. Billy Joe and the band had learned a lot in the previous couple of years and wanted to put all that into practice. And since American Idiot had been so bloody big, I mean, who was going to tell them no? 21st Century Breakdown, which came out on May 15th, 2009, is set in Detroit. The main characters are Christian and Gloria, who are trying to sort their way through life in America after George W. To make the narrative a little bit more 
comprehensible, the album is divided into acts. There's heroes and cons, charlatans and saints, and horseshoes and hand grenades. If you listen critically, you'll see that Billy Joe sings a lot in the first person, and you kind of get the idea that Christian and Gloria are vehicles for telling his autobiography. Seriously, look at the lyrics and compare them to Billy Joe's life story and the stories of the people around him. What personal truths lie beneath songs like this? Think about that the next time you listen to 21st Century Breakdown, their second rock opera in a row. Now, so far, we've talked about big, big major acts. We've talked about Green Day and Nine Inch Nails and Queens of the Stone Age, My Chemical Romance. But I want to tell you about an independent recording, a concept album by a group from Brooklyn called The Antlers. And this is called Hospice. Concept albums don't have to be big, complex, highly theatrical projects. Sometimes they can be just quiet and poignant. In August of 2009, Hospice was released. The story is about a relationship that unfolds through an analogy. The analogy involves a terminally ill patient in hospice care who is suffering from bone cancer. She is angry and abusive. And a hospice worker, a man, becomes attached to this patient and then falls in love despite the abuse that she dishes out. He doesn't seem to mind that, and he doesn't seem to care that the woman is going to die. The whole story is written out in the liner notes. Now, we know very little of what inspired the 10 songs in this album, other than it appears that the events were drawn from the life of Antlers frontman Peter Silberman. He just doesn't want to talk about it. This is a track called Kettering, as in the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. The Antlers with Kettering from an absolutely beautiful but gut-wrenching concept album entitled Hospice, which is centered around a dying cancer patient and her male nurse. I'd have to say that that's my second favorite concept album for the first decade of the 21st century, with the first being, like I said, Year Zero from Nine Inch Nails. Now, if you are sufficiently intrigued by the concept record, let me give you a few more to check out. This is War from 30 Seconds to Mars is designed to be a deep record about spiritual things and who, as a society, we've become during the last 10 years. It's about isolation and alienation and loneliness. And it gets into what leader Jarrett Leto calls the universal sadness. You might want to look at The Resistance from Muse, which plays deeply into Matt Bellamy's conspiracy theories involving everything from the Illuminati on down. If you're into science fiction, you'd be hard-pressed to beat Coheed and Cambria, who released nothing but concept albums. Their records are all installments in the storyline of the Armory Wars, which takes place in Heaven's Fence, a federation of 78 planets connected by the Keywork, a special sort of energy. The band's 2010 album, Year of the Black Rainbow, also came in a deluxe version, which included a 352-page novel written by singer Claudio Sanchez. Doesn't get much more conceptual than that, does it? Then there's Gorillas. I mean, everything they do is conceptual. In fact, the band itself is nothing but an animated concept created by Damon Albarn and cartoonist Jamie Hewlett. The Mars Volta. They like to run themes through their records. And let's not forget the Arcade Fire in the suburbs. That entire album was built around the memories Wynn and Will Butler had of growing up in the areas in and around Houston. And there were plenty more CDs we could talk about. So I, I apologize if I didn't mention your favorite, but you can see how there's been an avalanche of these sorts of projects since 2000. Like I said back at the beginning, record labels like the idea of concept records because they theoretically encourage people to buy entire albums, not just cherry pick the songs they like. So there's really no reason this trend won't continue until the album has finally been killed off, if that ever happens. Again, I apologize if I didn't mention your favorite alt-rock concept record, but there are just so many now Maybe you didn't know that any of the albums we covered were actually more than just a collection of random songs. Maybe now you'll listen to them differently and in order, avoiding the temptation of hitting the skip button. Tactical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. 
You've been listening to the ongoing history of new music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 